This morning, we're taking a brief break from our study of the seven signs of Jesus to talk about the vision of our church, but we're still going to stay in the book of John and focus on the text of Scripture as we look at John 4, 1 through 42 today. We're going to break this passage up because 42 verses is a lot to read all at once. And so we're going to start by looking at the first nine verses of John chapter 4. Hear the word of our Lord for us this morning. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So the story begins with Jesus leaving Jerusalem after the Passover and traveling through Samaria to get home. He could have gone along the Jordan River to the east or along the Mediterranean Sea to the west and stayed among his kind of people, but those journeys are a little longer and Jesus chose to take the shorter path, the more difficult path along the ridges of the mountains from Jerusalem up north into Galilee, and so he had to go through the region of the Samaritans. And back then, Jews and Samaritans did not get along very well. This conflict was rooted back in between the northern and southern tribes. When the northern tribe of Israel was conquered by Assyria, they were carted off. And Assyria's practices, they would scatter conquered people among the whole empire so they would lose their cultural identity and become Assyrians. So they scattered the, the northern tribes and then moved new people into the land. But we read in the Old Testament that when the new people moved in, they got attacked by wild animals, by lions. And so the king of Assyria said, we need to find out why the lions are attacking the people. They sent for some of the priests from the northern tribe to come back to teach the, the, the Assyrian transplants how to worship God so the lions would stop eating them. Aren't you glad you read your whole Bible when you were a kid? It's a weird story, right? So they came back and they taught them how to worship God, but they didn't teach them to worship God in Jerusalem, but to worship God on the high places on the top of the mountains. These are the Samaritans. They are some of the Jews, who, or some of the Israelites who got left behind and intermarried with these other people who the Assyrians moved in. And now they learn to worship God on the mountains, not in the temple. And the Jews consider the Samaritans to be at best half breeds, at worst traitors, and in all instances, they're religious and cultural enemies. And so they don't like to spend time with them. They don't like to talk to them. They try to avoid them. But Jesus chooses to go through the land of Samaria on his way back to Galilee. And he chooses to stop at a well just outside of one of their villages. And then he sits down. He puts himself in a position where he will come into contact with people who are not believers from any Jew's perspective. They're heathens. In fact, they're worse than heathens. They don't know they're heathens. They think they're following God and they're not. And Jesus intentionally puts himself in a place where he will meet them. And he sits down at the well and this woman shows up. Now I want you to think for a moment what it's like to live in a hot, dry climate where it's 80, 90, 100 degrees every day. Now think about that for a moment. Doesn't that sound really nice today? Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, it will sound even better Wednesday morning when the high is negative one. But imagine you're there in this warm, hot, dry climate. And what we know is that when you're in desert kind of regions, it's cool in the morning 
It's cool in the evening, and at noon it is scorching, blazing hot, and everyone hides from the sun. Except this woman who goes to the well to carry water back for whatever family she has in the village in the heat of the day. Have you ever carried like four gallons of milk at one time? Does it get heavy after a little while when you're carrying them in your arms? Now imagine putting it all on your head, but it's more like 10, perhaps, gallons. And it's the heat of the day. Why would she do this? The answer, of course, is you only go to the well at noon if you are trying to avoid everyone else in town. Otherwise, you would go in the evening or in the morning. No one goes in the heat of the day except the social pariahs, the outcasts. This woman has been divorced multiple times. This is not a judgment on her, by the way, because in that day and age, you could not get divorced if you were a woman. Only men could get divorced. Women had no say in the matter one way or the other. So this is not a woman who's done anything wrong that we know of. She has been many times rejected by men who have divorced her, whether it was her desire or not. Women also couldn't really have jobs or keep property. And so the only way for a woman to provide for herself was to be attached to a man who could have a job and have property and provide for her. So this woman has no options in life, and she finally finds a guy who says, I won't marry you, but I'll shack up with you for however long I want. And it's the best option she has. And she comes to the well in the heat of the day because no one cares about her. She is a nobody. She is the reject. She is the unwanted one. And she comes to the well, and there's not supposed to be anybody there. But Jesus is there, leaning against the well, waiting. You could hardly imagine two more different people meeting, right? There's Jesus, who's never done anything wrong in his life, right? Because he's the non one who never sinned. And this woman whose life is absolute chaos from other people's fault or her own, most likely other people's fault. And they're from different religions. They have their different genders. They're different ethnicities. They come from different income brackets. She has nothing. She is the poor and the outcast. Jesus comes from a father who was a tech a technon, one of the, the, the builders, he was a skilled tradesman. If they were poor, they were the wealthiest of the poor. If they're middle class, they're in the lower end of middle class. He's one of the better off. He's in like the top 20% of his day. She's at the very bottom. They have almost nothing in common. But Jesus is there. And he begins to talk with her because for Jesus, all of the things that would separate them cannot overcome the fact that God loves her. And there is no one outside of, great, of God's grace. There's no one too far gone for God to not be able to redeem them. Remember earlier in John 3, Jesus says that God so loved the entire world that he sent his only son. There is no one that God doesn't love. It doesn't matter what their, what, what their ethnicity is, what their income is, what their educational level is, what their nationality is, or what their past is. There is no one outside of the love of God. And so Jesus is there waiting for her. And they talk. Recently I heard Ed Stetzer share a story. Ed Stetzer is the distinguished chair, the Billy Graham chair of evangelism and um, world mission for Wheaton College, something like that. He's, he's like the one that pastors go to learn how do we reach our culture today? What should we be thinking about and doing? He's like an expert. He goes all over talking to church people. So he told this story. He got an Uber ride a year or so ago from Jane. He got him back in Jane's car and in the middle, she had a little a tray of like snacks and goodies because you want to get good reviews when you're an Uber driver and she had a Bible. And Jane started talking with him as they're driving along and Ed didn't tell her who he was or what he did and she kept trying to steer the conversation to talk about spiritual things. And it was clear she was trying to figure out, are you a believer or not? And, and would he be open to hearing about Jesus? And he just kept, you know, playing along but not giving her any information on what he did. And finally, he, his, his wife nudged him and said, you need to tell her. So he told her who he was. And then he said, you need to know you're doing a great job. 
Because here she is driving her car as an Uber driver, and when people get in her car, she's got a Bible there, and she starts talking about spiritual things to see if there's a door open to tell them about Jesus and how God loves them. And then Ed interviewed her and talked with her about what that's like. If you want to read the interview, go home and Google Jane the Uber driver. The first article up is from Christianity Today, and it's, it's Ed Stetzer's interview with Jane the Uber driver. But she says that when she does this, she often gets to pray with people, and sometimes she even gets to tell them about Jesus, and people want to follow up and learn more about who God is because she thinks that everyone who gets in her car is someone God loves and would want to know and would want that person to know who God is. And so she looks for any chance to talk about God with the people who get in her car, including having a Bible in the middle so that they know that she's that kind of person. And she'll let them have the Bible if they want, I imagine. I didn't catch that in the article, but it seems like she's the kind of person who would do that. So it got me thinking as, I, as I've been reflecting on that story over the last couple of weeks. I wonder, I wonder what God could do with a church full of Janes. I wonder what God could do with a church full of people who everywhere they went thought, that person over there is loved by God. I hope they know. What can I do to make sure they know God loves them? What could God do with a church full of Jane the Uber drivers? What, can, what would a church like that be like? What would the stories that are being told in the narthex after church in a church full of Jane the Uber drivers? I bet they have stories of, I was talking to so-and-so at my job and this is what happened. Or could you pray about so-and-so because I think they might be open to hearing about Jesus. And there'd be those conversations. Jane the Uber driver has them. Jesus is at the well and he has this long conversation with this woman and he steers it toward things of God too. And he tells her that he's the one who can give her living water. And we're not going to read all of that today. And then the disciples come back. And we pick it up at verse 27. Just then we read, His disciples returned and were surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. I don't want, don't want you to worry about the disciples right now. I want you to just pay attention to the woman. There's a break in her conversation with Jesus. And she's so excited to have met Jesus that she leaves her water jar. The whole purpose of coming to the well doesn't get any water forgets the task of the day. Remember, there's no running water. This is what they need to eat and to cook food and to drink and bathe, all of that. They need the water. She leaves it. She goes back to the village. The outcast, the one who everyone whispers about, the one that people refuse to be with, the one that people mock and reject, goes back to the village and tries to gather everyone together to tell them who Jesus is so they can come out to the well and meet him too. This, by the way, I think is how God typically reaches new people. He doesn't send some theologically trained, head full of Bible knowledge know-it-all who went to seminary like me. He sends a person who has met Jesus to tell people like them that they already know about Jesus. To tell the people near to them who are far from God about God so they can draw near to God too. She's not coming to them from a, from a position of power. She's not coming with all sorts of more knowledge than them. She just met Jesus and needs them to know. Later, Jesus sends his 12 disciples out and he sends them among the Jewish people, people like themselves, and they tell them about God and the coming of the kingdom. Then in Acts, God sends Paul. Paul is a Jew raised speaking Greek in a Greek-speaking Roman city. And where does God send Paul? to Greek-speaking Roman cities, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Paul gathers around himself, half Jews and Gentiles, and they go to the people who are like them and tell them about God, and that's how we all came to faith. Because God called people like us to send to us, our ancestors, maybe 1,500 years ago. But at some point, that's how it started. This is still how God usually works. 
I heard a story recently from, from my friend Yakuv. Yakuv is involved in church planting in one part of Nepal, and Good News Nepal is involved in church planting discipleship in the other part of Nepal. And we, we're involved in, in both of those. So I was talking with Yakuv, and he told a story of uh, a young man and his family from where they are who moved to a farm. And when they moved to the new, new place, they, they realized they were the only believers within 120 miles of where they lived. Within 120 square miles, 120 miles, every direction, I don't know which, I didn't think to ask for details. So 120 miles of some measure, I don't know which. You can figure it out on your own and guess. But 120 miles, only believer. So think about how much square miles it is, how many people, they're the only believers. Yakuv's dad is friends with this young man's dad. And so the young man's dad came to Yakuv's dad and said, could you go visit my son and encourage him? They're all alone. They're the only believers. So Yakuv's dad went to go visit. And he met with this young man and his family and his wife and the kids. And he said, you're the only light of the gospel in this community. You are the ambassador God has chosen so these people can know about God. You better get working. You must be the pastor God's called for this place. Never went to seminary. I don't know if he can read or not, honestly. He's a farmer in Nepal. I don't know enough to know. But he heard the word and he took it seriously that he must be the light that God has sent into that community. And so he started reaching out and befriending their neighbors and telling their neighbors about Jesus. Six months later, Yakub's father brought Tom Ellenbos from Harbor Church Network and some other people to go visit this pastor, this, sorry, this farmer in this small town in the middle of nowhere where no other believers were. And they came to visit. And six months after he was told, you're the light God sent here to tell about people about Jesus, there's a small little church built in the village and every Sunday 30 believers gather who did not know God until this man came and told them because God sent him to be the ambassador there. If you go back 30 years, we would have said if we're going to reach Nepal, we need to find a seminary trained white person, have them learn to speak Nepalese, pay them all sorts of money and benefits and fly them over there and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to eventually reach one person for Jesus. And it would literally cost hundreds of thousands of dollars because that's not how God does things. God reaches people by sending someone who is like them to them. That's how the gospel spreads. By you telling the people who are near to you but far from God about the God who loves them. That's how it happens. There is no one better equipped to reach your friends your family, your neighbors, your co-workers with the gospel than you. There is no one better equipped than you. You already know them. You have something in common with them. They live next door, you work together, your kids go to the same school, you have something in common. You probably talk with them regularly. That's how you became friends. You probably have shared interests with them. There is no one better equipped to reach the people near to you but far from God than you. You're the one God has sent. This is how the gospel spreads. One person at a time, life on life, when you introduce people who are near to you but far from God to the God who loves them. And lives begin to change. So who might God be sending you to reach today? I guarantee none of you are in as difficult a place as that young man in Nepal where it was him and his wife and his kids and no one else. Who might God be sending you to reach today? The disciples are not so worried about the woman. They're worried about Jesus and how Jesus didn't get lunch. And so we pick it, up at, pick it up at verse 34. Jesus says this, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad 
together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The fields are ripe for the harvest. This is the vision Jesus gives his disciples in the first century, and it's the same vision he gives our church in the 21st century. You know, back when I, when I was a kid, you could divide the United States into four groups of people. Roughly, all were roughly the same size. 25% of them were what we'll call convictional Christians. They thought the Bible was true. They thought that the only way to salvation was through Jesus. I don't know if you can read the picture. It's a picture of a, from a book. So if you can't read it, I'll explain it. Um, and they went to church regularly. And they thought it really mattered and it affected all the ways they lived. The next 25% were what we'll call congregational Christians. They belonged to a church. They'd probably read the Bible a little bit. They went to church once in a while. They never missed Christmas and Easter and maybe a few other times every year. And then there were the nominal Christians. They didn't go to church. They didn't really know much about Christianity, but they knew good Americans are Christians. So if you asked them, they would have said, I'm a good American, I must be a Christian. And so that's what they were. But it did not really radically affect their lives in any significant way. And then 25% of, them, of Americans were non-believers. They were followers of other religions. Um, they were agnostic. They were spiritual, but not religious. They were into New Age kind of things. And over the last 50 years, something has happened. And some of you experienced this, and it causes some anxiety for us, right? That it used to be that these first three groups all kind of agreed on basic morality and, and how we ought to live together. And over the last 50 years, something has happened. The cultural divide between the secularists and the nominal Christians and congregational Christians has shrunk, and the one between people who believe it's all true and everyone else has grown. There's a cultural divide now where we try to still hold to biblical Christian ethics and the, what we would call the Judeo-Christian worldview, but most congregational Christians, most nominal Christians, and there's fewer of them than there used to be, no longer do. They hold to the values of a secular world, which is very disorienting for many of us because it feels like we used to be the majority and now we're the minority. I would suggest we've always been the minority, just other people agreed with us even if they didn't know why because they didn't know that other options. And now they've decided they don't want to agree with us anymore. In fact, if you're under the age of 35 and you're not a Christian, you will no longer call yourself a nominal Christian because there's actually penalties socially for you to say you're a Christian when you're not because we don't have a very good reputation with young people. Which is why you see people who are spiritual and not religious growing among young people because they used to be nominally Christian. They never believed. They just said they were Christian. This percentage, the convictional Christians, those who have, who have gone to church and they thought the Bible was true and they thought the only way to be saved was through Jesus and they wanted to try to follow the ethics of, of Christianity, that percentage has almost hardly changed at all. It's trending downward. It'll probably be down to about 20% of the United States rather than 25%. But it's not plummeting like we might think. These two groups, the middle that used to say they agreed with us but didn't actually follow Jesus, no longer say that. This is actually good news. This is why it's good news. How do you convince someone who thinks they're a Christian already because they say they're a Christian that they aren't? That's really hard to do. But once people start admitting, yeah, I don't actually believe, now you can start talking about, well, why should you believe? The fields are riper now than they were 10 years ago. The fields are riper now than they were 20 or 30 years ago because when people get honest about who they are, they can finally hear the truth of who, of who God has called them to be. The fields are ripe for the harvest. In 1954, a group of people gathered in Milt Gazin's living room. They all attended First Reformed Church over on Wilson Avenue here in Granville. And there wasn't room for all of them in the church anymore. They didn't fit. So they were, some of them were sent to the basement every Sunday to sit in the basement and listen to the service over a speaker. This was before closed circuit TV. No video, just the sound in the basement. Who thinks that would be fun? 
Nah, no one raises their hand, right? So they got together in 1954 and they said, we need a new church because there should always be room for new people to meet God. And every church should have space for new people to come to know God. And so they took a chance, and in January 1955, they held their first worship service of Zion Reformed Church at Bursley Elementary School. They did not have permission to start this church. After they started the church, they got permission. Because they'd started it, everyone got on board and said, I guess we should do this now. But they did not get permission ahead of time. No one said they could. They just did it. We still have a few founding members among us, and I don't know if any of them are here today as I'm looking out. So if you're a founding member or the son or, 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 or the child or grandchild of a founding member, can you stand a minute? I'm going to make Jackie Deiter stand up. And there's a few of you out here yet. Grandchildren have to stand too, right? Stay, stay standing. Founding members, stay standing. So I want to thank you. And, and for those of you who weren't actually founding members but are the kids and grandkids of them, Thank your parents, because it is not a, a small thing to, against the authority of the consistory of, another, of your church, and on your own say, we're going to do something that no one has done here recently, and we're going to plant a new church. Because the mission of God mattered more to them than their comfort or their convenience. Reaching people for Jesus mattered more to your so some of you who founded it, and for some of your parents and grandparents, it mattered more to them than whether or not their friends liked what they did. It was costly to start our church, but the mission of God mattered more. And so thank you to our founding members. You all can sit down. So thank you for standing. And Mark Vanderzown and Don Vanderzown, can you thank your parents because they weren't here today and I wanted to be able to thank them too. Thelma's our church historian, so I get all my facts on our past from her because she knows everything. So, but they started it in 1955. And then in the late 1960s, Zion Reformed Church was instrumental in the founding of Fairhaven Church in Hudsonville because we believed that people needed a church closer to their home and more people were living in Hudsonville. And so we helped start Fairhaven Church. Fairhaven Church is now the Harbor Church Network. And this Sunday, about 3,000 people will gather in worship through the Harbor Church Network because people from Zion had a heart and said, we're willing to do, take a risk and plant something new that may not benefit us, but will benefit other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 3,000 people, because in the late 60s, people from Zion said, something matters more than our comfort and convenience. Reaching more people for God comes first. Then the last five years, we all plant Lifeline Community Church in Wyoming and City Chapel, downtown Grand Rapids. Neither of those are Harbor Church Network size. But today, both of them will worship around 100 to 120 people, well, roughly half of whom in both contexts were not regularly attending church until those churches were planted because you were willing to take a chance and plant a church in Wyoming when all of their backers backed out the week before worship started at Lifeline. And because you said no one can plant a church downtown, but we're willing to try, the denomination said we don't know how to do this, but we'll give it a shot. That was, our, that was the sales pitch. We have to learn how. Well, are you willing to help us learn how? And we said yes. And 100 people are gathering at City Flats at, for, for, for worship at City Chapel this morning. And every week, all year long, since they opened, because you had the faith and the willingness to step out like that. Throughout its history, Zion has sent its members into the ordained ministry and around the world as missionaries. We have one of the largest walls of fame in our back over there, all the people who have been ordained through our church, especially given our size. And we're going to add another one in a couple of years, Jeremy. And someday Chelsea will get her picture taken and she'll go on the wall too. And we'll have a woman on the wall. For those of you who talk to Chelsea, remind her. But we believe that God is calling us to not only raise up a new generation of leaders to send around the world, but because we need a generation of leaders to send here. To send to our friends and neighbors, to our schools, to our local governments, to our homes, and to our workplaces, so that every corner of this community can hear the gospel again and can see it lived out in your life. Chris Orm and I have talked on occasion that Zion is a Levitical church in that we have a history of raising up leaders. The Levites were the ones who took care of the temple. And so we raise people up to lead in, their, in the church and to, and to lead in other churches. But as a consistory, as a staff, we sense stronger than ever that we are called to raise up leaders for our community, for here, 
so that we can experience the power of the gospel here in Granville and in Georgetown Township and in Hudsonville and in Wyoming. Researchers tell us that currently in the United States, every year 3,700 churches close. 30 years from now, that number is expected to climb to 5,500 churches closing every single year. That should make you a little bit sad. It makes me a little bit sad. My wife's home church closed just this past fall. Simply to keep up with that number of closings and the expected population growth in the United States, we need to plant on average 8,600 new churches every year in the United States. For context, our denomination is about 900 churches, so we need to plant nine denominations of the RCA size every single year, and we'd still be falling behind. And research tells us that the absolute best way to reach people who are not currently connected to God is by planting a new church in their community. There's all sorts of reasons for that, but statistically it is absolutely true. The best way to reach people who are not already connected with God is to plant a new church in their community. It is the best way. So I want you to imagine for a moment If we're called to reach these communities, this is only going to happen if we start living as missionaries here. Not simply praying for God to send missionaries there, but to recognize that God has sent a missionary here and that missionary lives in your house and sleeps in your bed and it's you. So imagine for a moment, what if each of us began living as an ambassadors of God's kingdom in their neighborhood? And when you went to work and when you were at school? What if you felt equipped to share your faith in a way that was persuasive and compelling to your friends so they'd want to know more? What if you learned to lead in such a way that when you were at work, other people said, I want so-and-so on my team because when they're on a team, things get done and it's done well because you've learned how to lead well and your leading well leads people to ask, how come what's different in you? And you can talk about how you try to lead with the same love and compassion Jesus has. What if you became like that? What if our lives really were just tiny little rivulets of water that when they form together turn into streams and eventually turn into the Grand River and eventually flow into Lake Michigan and they make a giant lake full of water of people's lives who have been changed? What if by living as ambassadors we saw new small groups form in our communities that don't even go to church with us but they just want to know about God? And so we disciple people who may not come to Zion, but they want to learn who Jesus is. Or new relationships built that we have people who regularly are meeting with someone else just to read the Bible and talk about it together to learn who God is. What if every day each one of us woke up ready to see what door God had opened for us to love in his name, to speak the truth of who Jesus is, into someone else's life. What could God do here? Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus says that the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. So we should pray for for the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. I would suggest today that we should absolutely pray for God to send workers into the field. But we need to remember that when God sends workers into the field, it's probably you that needs to go. Because workers don't get to stay stay in the barn and celebrate all the crops other people brought in. They go in the field and they bring in the harvest. We want to help equip you to do that. To learn how to lead and to harvest and love like Jesus did. So that this community, not just Zion, but our community, might experience revival and an overflowing of the Spirit of God here. We believe this will happen by intentionally investing in you and training you for those things and and helping you learn how to grow in your leadership and your evangelism. And that as people meet Jesus, Zion's going to give birth to two new churches in the next seven years. That's the number we're putting out, two churches in seven years. By sending you to plant those churches, to reach the neighbors where you live, whether it's in Caledonia or in Hudsonville or way out in Hamilton, that God has sent you, and we want to send you. We want to be a church that doesn't hold on to its people, but sends them in mission, because that's who our God is.
We don't think we can do this on our own, but we're confident that when we strive to join God in the harvest field and point people to his son, God can do great things through us. Because he did it in the past when Zion was started. And he did it through the woman at the well. Listen to the end of this woman's story. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. God was on the move in Samaria 2,000 years ago. And God is on the move here today. So let's get into the field. Let's join him in the work of the harvest. And may many believe not just because of what we say, but because they meet Jesus. And they come to see him not only as their Savior, but as the Savior of the entire world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your Son. And for those who came before us who told us or our parents or our grandparents or great, great, great grandparents about your son. Father, we thank you for the gift of faith and we ask that now your spirit would be at work among us, sending us out to be Jane the Uber drivers wherever you have placed us. Sending us out to be as bold and courageous as a uneducated farmer in Nepal who's pastor in a church of 30 today because someone said you're the light in this community. Father, may we be the light in our communities, and through us may many come to know you. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen.